Our labours proved to be as heavy as Kern had promised, but the crew accepted them with a kind of satisfaction. For most of us, the glamour of life in port had already faded, and the desire for action at sea was mounting. Suddenly the work was done. Our departure was scheduled for the following morning. Again we went through the ritual of severing our connections with life. In solitude we labelled our surplus luggage and wrote last letters home and prepared our sea gear. Afterwards some of us emptied a bottle of wine. Others spent their last night in the arms of a sweetheart or a professional. But all of us wondered whether we would survive to go through these motions once again. The month of August in 1941 was but a few days old when U-557 sailed for her second patrol. At 2pm we removed the lines from the pillars, the obligatory band played a march, and a thunderous hurrah came from the commandant of the flotilla, officers and enlisted men. At the far end of the quay stood the public, including a number of girls who were waving tearful farewell to their lovers. The war had brought them together, the war separated them again. U-557 sailed out of Lorient under electric power. When she had Port Louis on her left, the diesels began to mutter their old, intimate song. Half of the ship's company was standing on the cigarette deck or leaning against the railing, smoking, chatting and enjoying a last hour of sunshine. A stern, picturesque Lorient and the Brittany coast slowly diminished. As our escort vessel departed, her skipper shouted through the megaphone, a pleasant trip and good hunting. The men were ordered below. The watch and the captain remained on deck, together with a newcomer who had embarked only thirty minutes before we had put out to sea. Captain Lieutenant Kelbling, a classmate of Paulson, had been assigned to us as a prospective commanding officer. He had no special function, his only duty was to round out his experience with one war patrol. Later we passed through a fleet of fishing boats lying lazily in the blazing sun, their yellow, red and green sails pointed into the deep blue sky like coloured sugar cones. As we approached the last of the trawlers, Paulson ordered quietly, both full ahead, set course 270. After the continent had sunk into the sea, U-557 submerged for her first trim dive. For three days we saw no enemy plane or smoke cloud. The Bay of Biscay was calm and deserted. When U-557 passed the 8th longitude west, Paulson opened the sealed envelope he had received from Admiral Dönitz. Our orders were to attack the convoy routes in the North Channel between Ireland and Scotland. Headquarters expected a heavy concentration of enemy shipping in that area. The envelope also contained details of the minefields near the Channel. U-557 took on a northwesterly course. The diesels roared the symphony that made every man's heart beat faster. The next morning at 7am sharp, the men off duty were awakened by a blaring loudspeaker. This was not the first time that phonograph music had heralded a new day aboard, but it was the first time that a British song was played. Everyone recognised the wishful lyrics, put on a broad smile and hummed with the British in chorus, We are hanging our washing on the Siegfried line. The British, far from being able to take our famous defensive line, had abandoned the record in Lorient, along with uniforms and war material, when they fled through France before our advancing troops in 1940. On the sixth day of our patrol, we sliced into a critical area, 120 miles southwest of Fastnet Rock, the lighthouse on the southernmost tip of Ireland. Here, the southern convoy routes converged to a narrow path not more than 80 miles wide. We made no contact, however, and continued on a circular course approximately 250 miles west of the Irish coast to avoid detection by the British aircraft. Eventually, we arrived at the 58th parallel, made a sharp turn to starboard, and went on an eastbound course toward the North Channel. Ten days after departing the French paradise, we reached a spot three miles northwest of the soaring cliffs of the island Inishtrahul, which lay almost in the centre of the shipping route. We tried to lurk there, for the island's lighthouse offered us an excellent navigational fix, but the strong current washing through the channel forced us back into the Atlantic, we cruised the area for several days without hearing a sound or spotting a ship. Obviously, the British had redirected their convoy traffic. The fruitless search began to affect the disposition of the crew. Paulson, frustrated, contacted Admiral U-Boats, asking to be relocated into better hunting grounds. The answer suggested that headquarters was receiving excellent intelligence from Nova Scotia. Proceed into AL-69, 
Halifax convoy expected general course east-northeast 11 knots, light defence, good hunting. We raced westward at high speed for three days. When we arrived at our designated position, it was night and the Black Sea breathed gently. U-557 stopped her engines, and the sound operator began his watch, however. We spent the night without spotting the enemy. With the first morning rays, we resumed our chase and crossed the square in irregular patterns. At 3.10pm the same afternoon, as I was plotting course at the small table in the control room, a man on the bridge shouted, Smoke cloud, bearing 300. The captain dashed past me and leapt to the top. I heard him hollering at the man in unmistakable anger. You call that a smoke cloud? It's a forest fire. Crew on battle stations, when I reached my place on the bridge, U-557 had turned toward the black smudge. As we approached, the cloud expanded into a broad black curtain of dense smoke and fumes. Then we spotted the mastheads and stacks of the zigzagging destroyers preceding the armada. Five minutes later, a forest of masts crept over the sharp edge of the horizon. We were on collision course with a huge convoy. 3.35 p.m. Alarm, 3.45 p.m. The parade of ships had not yet appeared in the eye of the scope. Paulson relied solely upon the report from the sound room. The crew moved quietly on action stations. The torpedo gang flooded the tubes. The second mate adjusted his computer. I took the helm. 4.10pm, two sweepers came into view, sailing in erratic patterns. 4.25pm, the sound gear picked up two destroyers, propellers whirring at high revolutions. Both hunters made their moves as if not quite sure in which direction to search for the silent enemy. Aztec impulses began to bounce against our hull. 4.35pm, the sound mounted in volume and density. The hammering of piston engines, the thrashing of propellers, and the knocking and rumbling of many approaching vessels reached a fierce crescendo. 4.45 p.m. Wiesner had calculated the convoy's speed and course. The rest was up to Paulson, and he swung his boat into attack position. His hands were busy adjusting the scope to the ups and downs of the sea, training the crosshair on the fattest targets. Suddenly he shouted the decisive order, Tubes 1 to 5 ready, tubes 1 to 5 are ready, assured Kern. Paulson released five shots within 25 seconds. We in the conning tower counted the seconds until the torpedoes hit. Meanwhile, the captain kept turning, extending and retracting the scope, watching the cargo ships approach in orderly fashion. There they swayed in a sluggish sea, innocently carried away to their destruction. Within a minute, this respectable parade of 45 rocking giants would be disrupted by fiery breaking ships. The rest of the vessels would spurt away, their crews terrified by the horror of devastation. Then came one, two, three hard explosions. The captain, all smiles, shouted, Executive, right down, hit on freighter, 5,000 tons, hit on second vessel, also 5,000 tons, hit on 4,000 ton freighter astern. Two misses. What's the matter with those damn torpedoes? 5.5pm. 5, 5 we in the tower were given a chance to view the Holocaust. Three vessels lay heavily listing, shooting smoke and fire columns into the air. White lifeboats hung head down in their davits. Two destroyers raced toward the dying ships. It was a painting of rare and vivid colours. 5.10pm. Depth charges detonated close by. Paulson jokingly insisted that they were at least 1,000 metres away. 5.20pm. Escorts disappeared. Sound contact with convoy was considerably reduced. 6 p.m. Cook distributed coffee and battle sandwiches, too much salami. The sweating torpedo gang hoisted up five steel fish and reloaded the tubes. The chief balanced the boat like a juggler. The captain sat at the scope watching the convoy flee toward the southern tip of Ireland. 9.25 p.m. U-557 surfaced. Only a very thin light line in the west indicated that the day a successful one for us had come to an end. Darkness hindered our sight, but the convoy could not run away. We were too close to its heels. With both engines full ahead, we pursued the battered herd. 10.5 p.m., we signalled headquarters. Convoy grid square AM-71, course 125, sunk three 14,000 tons light defence midnight. We turned to starboard and proceeded south, no convoy, 12.30 a.m. We dived to sound out the depth, reported the operator. Propeller noise bearing 300 to 360. Estimated distance, 10 miles. Ten minutes later, 
U-557 surged back to the surface. Once again, the song of the engines together with the swishing noise of the sea rushing alongside the hull produced the hymn which accompanied us into battle. A flare fell in the east. 1.15 a.m. destroyer 3,000 meters on port. We drew a big loop around the escort, swinging into the convoy's wake. It was as if we drove into nowhere. Sky and sea formed a solid black wall. 2.20 a.m. Two escorts shot out of the darkness, showing their white moustaches. Alarm, shouted Paulson. Dive to 170, hard left rudder. The furious commotion of our crash dive covered up the propeller noise of the destroyers, which were closing in on us with terrifying speed. We clung to pipes and equipment to hold our balance. That was how steeply U-557 hurtled into depth. Before the escorts could split her stern, she was already down to 90 metres. Two charges erupted in our wake, flogging the boat like a gigantic whiplash. Total darkness enveloped us for long seconds. U-557 fell and fell. It seemed to be the end. But the lights came on again, and Fedder levelled the boat off at a depth of 200 metres. 2.30 a.m., both destroyers had stopped. Silence above, silence inside the hull. Our sound man reported other propellers approaching. The escorts had called for reinforcement. We braced for a long barrage. 2.45 a.m., one escort began to run up on our port side. We veered at high speed to avoid her spread. Then we heard three splashes, soon followed by three infernal explosions. The well-placed cluster slammed our boat deeper. Hydraulic oil spouted across the control room. The steel groaned, motor relays tripped, planes and rudders jammed, deck plates jumped. As the echo of the booms subsided, someone threw the relays back in. The chief reduced the speed to silent running, and all was again quiet inside the iron drum. The well-trained destroyer crews above had stopped for a new probe into depth. 3.18 a.m. another attack began. Three cruel detonations came at close intervals. Then another run, we sat at our stations in the twilight of our emergency lighting, biting our lips and holding our breath as the Asdic pings grew unbearably loud. Some of the men lay on deck staring upward, Others were sitting and staring into an imaginary something. There was no talking, no coughing. The men showed no signs of desperation, only tiredness and stress. Hour after hour, the attacks were renewed sporadically and inaccurately. Depth was our prime advantage, our only protection. 12 p.m. Above us, they were still searching. The captain ordered fruit conserves and biscuits distributed. A healthy decision, the men relaxed a little as they took on nourishment. 2.12 p.m. the latest barrage brought the number of canisters dropped upon us. But the sound man claimed that he heard two escorts leave the scene, we were hopeful. 3.20 p.m. not a single detonation for over one hour had the Tommies run out of depth charges, had they abandoned their game. The sound operator turned his wheel with loving care. The entire horizon seemed to be free of hostile sound. Where was the third hunter? Paulson said. Start up bilge pump. Let's see whether they take that bait. The impertinent grinding sound tortured us like a dentist's drill. Though it betrayed our position, it produced no response from above. The third enemy had also departed. 4.10 p.m., U-557 surfaced after being submerged for 14 hours. As the captain opened the bridge hatch, I was literally thrown out of the hull by our internal pressure. Brilliant weather greeted us. We inhaled the fresh air gratefully, though a sudden abundance of it almost made us black out. The ventilators transported oxygen to the sweating hands inside the drum. For us on the bridge, the sun was never so red, nor the sky so blue. Since the convoy had fled safely beyond our reach, U-557 raced west in search of new targets. We travelled three days, covering 450 miles in a medium sea. On the fourth night, a U-boat operating in the extreme north flashed a signal across the Atlantic. Convoy AJ-35, course east 12 knots, attack, taking the queue. We changed course and dashed into old, faraway hunting grounds. Simultaneously, other boats deciphered the message and raced to intercept the convoy. However, headquarters had other plans for U-557. We were instructed to proceed into a different area, leaving the loot to others. The boat's company cursed like pirates over spilled rum, as it turned out, a large wolf pack made contact with a Halifax convoy. One by one, their torpedoes crashed into its flanks and decimated it. Short signals came rushing in, 
proclaiming victory in one of the greatest battles ever fought in the Atlantic. Those messages, accumulating on the captain's desk, reflected the ferocity of the assault which sent ship after ship to her grave. The radiograms were as precise as the shots the captains fired. Torpedoes expended, sunk five 24,000 tons, set for base, sunk three 18,000 tons, damaged two, keep contact, two vessels sunk, depth charge damages, return to base, have sunk four 21,000, continue hunt. The battle went on cruelly for two more nights and days. Through those hours of ruthless sinkings, we stayed tuned in on our German radio stations and listened to the special bulletins that informed the nation of our victory at sea. Then the wolves lost the convoy in the northern fog, leaving the bottom littered with twenty battered hulks. As one of the triumphant U-boats headed home, it crashed into another convoy, and at once a new hunt began. This time U-557 was ordered to operate against the target. As we approached the northern region, the sea rose higher. Cold spray and foam and a slashing wind mauled me during my watch on the bridge. Visibility quickly dropped from 16 miles to 4. The typical North Atlantic weather caught up with us once again. U-557 beat the waves head-on and listed strongly in the long breakers as the chase went into its second day. Alarm, it was exactly 5.30pm. The boat tilted immediately and submerged fast. Paulson, racing into the control room, called into the tower. Executive, what's the matter up there? Kern replied through frozen lips. Destroyer bearing 30 distance, 4,000 metres. As soon as the chief had the boat under control, the sound man reported that high-pitched propellers were slowly disappearing. We had not been detected. The operator made another discovery. Wide sound band port ahead must be a convoy. We had run into the starboard flank of an unreported convoy. Paulson ordered the crew on battle stations and the boat on periscope depth. The scope revealed nothing, so the captain brought us to the surface. As soon as the tower was clear, we rushed through cascading waves onto the platform. Visibility was only two miles. A thick layer of clouds hung just above the boiling sea. We immediately pushed after the source of the sound band. Forty minutes later, we again sighted an escort and quickly outmaneuvered her. The sea, rolling from west to east, drove us violently ahead as huge long waves lifted our boat at her stern and carried her forward high on their crests. While in hot pursuit through a violet twilight, we informed Admiral U-Boats of our discovery. It soon became apparent, however, that the convoy made drastic changes of course. We continued eastward for two hours in a huge zigzag pattern, but detected no convoy. Reluctantly, Paulson ordered the chief to dive to take a new sound check. The sound man reported a faint disturbance on starboard 40. We surfaced at once. Dusk had closed in and visibility was reduced to less than a mile. U-557 swayed and listed in a tumultuous sea. Sheets of water broke over the superstructure, lashing our faces and burning our eyes. I sought cover in a squatting position, with my glasses levelled over the rim of the bridge, but the fierce spray split my skin and lips, drenched the Turkish towel I had wrapped around my neck, and ran down my back into my boots. I shivered in the chill of the night despite my triple layer of clothing, topped by a one-piece diver's suit of thick rubber. U-557 kept thrusting toward the enemy. It was almost midnight when a shadow moved into my glasses. Then there were two, three, four. Paulson saw them, and the executive also saw them. Two escorts flitted nervously at the tail of the starboard column, and one zigzagged ahead of our boat, all of them unaware of our breakthrough. Huge, shadows, giant cargo ships pitched about unperturbed, their broad flanks inviting a shot. U-557 gradually swung into attack position. An escort broke toward us through the wall of darkness, but we eluded her by sneaking close to a huge freighter. Paulson pushed into the herd from astern. No enemy eye could spot our boat in the high wind-swept whirlpool. As Paulson steered tenaciously in between two columns, the fat shadows grew monstrous. The captain shouted into the raging storm, Executive, pick your targets. Make it quick. We can shoot only once. Have them all on a string. Tubes one to five ready. Ready. Hard right rudder. Paulson screamed. Shoot, Executive. Seconds later, two torpedoes leapt out of their tubes. Quickly, another fan shot left the boat against an overlapping target. 
Finally, the last torpedo churned toward the nearest shadow in the column. Then there was breathless waiting. Three hard explosions bellowed into the night. Three volcanoes erupted almost simultaneously. Three sharp shocks rocked the boat. Dozens of star shells climbed into the sky and countless parachute flares hung in the clouds, illuminating the wild seascape with a ghastly green and yellow glare. We had long since escaped the scene of disaster when two escorts arrived to rescue survivors. The impact upon the enemy was so severe, the confusion so great, that no serious counteraction followed. As a result, we risked staying on the surface to reload the tubes. We clung to the convoy, carefully holding our distance behind the shadows. The stricken convoy had made a sharp turn to the north, but the wolf was still within the flock. Some distance to the south, three vessels lost their struggle, and the last flickering flames were swallowed by the violent sea. Forty minutes after the attack, our last two torpedoes were ready for use. U-557 closed the gap. Minutes later, we had the targets before our tubes dead ahead, with the rudder turned hard, our boat surged in an arc into proper position. Then two brief commands, two light shocks, and the last torpedoes sprang from their tubes. The captain said, That's all, gentlemen. Both engines emergency ahead. Hard right rudder. Set course 180, U-557 turned away and escaped at top speed. We watched the targets for 60 seconds, 70 seconds. We counted and waited and hoped. But the two torpedoes were failures. During those moments between life and death, I pictured the seamen on their doomed vessels, riding the huge waves holding onto life rafts. I felt sorry for those courageous men who had to suffer and go down with their ship. It was a terrible ending of a hopeless struggle. I could understand why the British seamen persisted. They were fighting for the very existence of their country. But I was bewildered by the stubbornness of the captains and crews from foreign lands. Why did they continue sailing for the British, defying our torpedoes and the growing ferocity of the battles? Whatever price the British had paid for their services, it could not have been enough to compensate for their risks and very lives. I was astounded that His Majesty's Admiralty was still able to recruit any number of foreign ships. Thirty minutes after our last attack, we informed headquarters of our night's encounter and advised that we would be sending beacon signals to home other wolves toward the herd. For three hours, we remained in cautious proximity to the convoy, transmitting the beacons vital to the continuation of the battle. Then two detonations, accompanied by two fire fountains in the front half of the convoy, indicated that another U-boat had arrived. Our mission was completed. At 5.30am, U-557 dived into secure depth. There, the captain had a surprise for us. The sinking of six ships called for the opening of some medicine bottles that had been kept under lock and key. With cup in hand, each man filed through the narrow aisle halted at the captain's tiny corner for as long as it took him to pour a rare shot of cognac. Then we retreated to our stations or bunks, sipping the potent liquid. After twenty hours of running submerged, U-557 surfaced and set course for the Bay of Biscay. Our second patrol, which ended on September 18th, had produced a different kind of crew. We were now seasoned warriors in the powerful force that had reshaped Europe in just two years, our hit-and-destroy operation against the major convoy we had discovered had been an important contribution to the inevitable defeat of England. We ourselves had sunk three ships of the convoy, bringing our total to six and thirty-two thousand tons. Our attack was continued by other U-boats, which sank six more vessels in less than four days. Moreover, this engagement broadened into a great twelve-day battle against three convoys crossing the North Atlantic in staggered pattern, Altogether, our U-boats had hit the incredible number of twenty ships out of the first convoy, four out of the second, and nine out of the third, making a toll of thirty-three ships totalling at least 165,000 tonnes, all sunk within two weeks. These extraordinary sinkings proved again the great potential of our Wolfpack tactic, which left the British defence helpless, and turned the Atlantic and the waters around England into a graveyard for Allied shipping. We had indeed reason to feel proud. As victorious veterans, we took for granted the hearty reception that greeted us at the quay in Lorient. The cheering crowd, the flowers, the brassy band music, the respectful salutes of the flotilla's commandant and his staff, all this was our due. 
The only unexpected bonus was the bold appearance of the girls from the establishments, who could not resist the temptation to welcome home their best customers. A night filled with warm embraces made a pleasant prospect for our crewmen, but even this had become just another routine part of the sailor's life. Our first duty after landing was to attend the usual ceremonial dinner at the prefecture. The meal was a long and rich one, laced successively with champagne, red wine and German beer. When the speeches ended and the men dispersed to their respective quarters, I was sent back on board U-557 to take charge of the watch the first night in port. The boat lay like a phantom in the low tide. My three guards stood on deck enjoying the lukewarm night. I went below, into the stifling stench of oil, grease, sweat and decaying food. The sudden calm and motionless state of the boat that had rocked and pitched and had spread death and destruction for almost fifty days was a new sensation. I realised how important this delicate instrument had become to me. Its power was now a vital part of my life, if not a part of myself. Knowing that I would have very little time later, I sat down on the captain's green leather mattress, switched on a small headlamp over his narrow desk, and wrote my letters home. My night watch ended early. It was barely morning when workmen came aboard and began stripping U-557 of all moving parts in preparation for her transfer to dry dock for refitting. The crew, the majority just back from the establishments, set themselves up in the old naval complex in quarters that had been greatly improved while we were at sea. I found that my living conditions were even better. The flotilla had assigned me a large room in the local Hotel Beau Séjour, and my luggage was already there when I arrived. For the first time since we sailed, I was able to take a shave and hot shower. After washing away my filth and smell, I rolled myself in white, fresh-smelling linen, spread out in my huge bed, and fell into a long sleep. Our first three days in port gave us just enough time to recuperate and prepare ourselves for the obligatory meeting with Admiral Dönitz. Again, the ceremony took place in the sun-drenched plaza in front of the prefecture, with the band playing a march and a large number of high officers in attendance. Dönitz showered us with iron crosses and took time to pin a medal on my chest. That day, in late September, was significant for another reason. After the ceremony on the plaza, my classmates Gerloff and Gobel were informed of their immediate transfer to U-boat school. The day had started out as a happy one, but this news dampened our enthusiasm. In the evening, the three of us had a fine dinner in town to celebrate our decorations and their new assignment as well. We toasted one another and promised to sink many more enemy ships before the war would end. My friends departed on the morning train. I never met them again. Both found their graves in different places in the Atlantic. For each, the first patrol after school became the last. The departure of my friends was not the only bitter pill to swallow. About the same time, the good news from the Atlantic and Eastern fronts was mixed with word of two important U-boat casualties. Long after it actually happened, headquarters reluctantly announced that U-47, with her famous Captain Gunther Prien in command, had been attacked while pursuing a convoy and sunk by a British destroyer. Prien was known as the Bull of Scarpa Flow because he had dared to enter the British home fleet's sanctuary in 1939. Here he had sunk the battleship Royal Oak and damaged the seaplane carrier Pegasus. Prien was stopped after having sunk almost 200,000 gross weight tons of Allied shipping. Also lost was U-556, under the command of much decorated Captain Wolfhart, she had been wrecked by a heavy depth charge series, but her captain and most of her crew had been rescued by the three attacking British destroyers. Wolfhart, too, was one of the aces with more than 100,000 tons to his credit. It seemed to me that men like Wolfhart and Preen could not be replaced, yet the U-boat war was creating aces much faster than it destroyed them. Now that I was the only ensign aboard U-557, triple duty fell upon my shoulders. As work on the boat proceeded rapidly, my days were filled with responsible tasks. I got no help from the captain, who quickly departed for Lake Constance and home, or from his classmate Kelbling, who left our company four days after our return, or from the executive and Seibold, who hurried off on a two-week leave. But my labours were not without reward. In the evenings I walked through the streets of Lorient, enjoying my solitude or retreated into a cosy restaurant, supplementing the sailor's ration at the base with a delicious dinner 
and some of those lukewarm nights made perfect covers for my escapades. By the time the crew began to reassemble, however, I had my fill of the pleasures of liberty in port. On October 8th, U-557 set out for the third time, again heading for the North Atlantic. After a few days of calm sailing, we left the Bay of Biscay astern and encountered high seas. Summer had ended, and the first gale winds of autumn lashed the waves to tremendous heights. Under a sky thick with dark clouds, the mountainous waves toyed with our boat, tossed her wildly, and kept the bridge half filled with water. U-557 worked frantically to stay on course and make headway. On the sixth day of our patrol, we reached a position approximately 300 miles west-southwest of the North Channel. That afternoon, as we traversed our old hunting grounds, I was put in charge of the third watch part of the greater responsibilities that the captain now entrusted to me. The watch was a harsh one, the gale whipping the water to a milky froth crusted our eyes and noses with salt. Our binoculars were useless. After three hours on the bridge, I spotted a destroyer moving into our starboard aft quarter. I immediately pointed our stern toward the Grey Menace, increased speed, and informed Paulson. I assumed the ship was a part of the convoy's defence. The captain arrived in a hurry, secured his steel belt to a clamp at the superstructure, and put both diesels into high gear. Following orders to concentrate on supply-bearing freighters, Paulson wasted no torpedoes on the destroyer, but sped away from her. Within minutes, the bouncing ship had fallen back to the horizon. For two hours we tracked the escort's evasive manoeuvres, hoping she would reveal the whereabouts of the convoy. At 3.20pm, Wiesner, who continually plotted the enemy's zigzags, identified a general westward path. The convoy had to be south of the escort. After another hour of battling giant waves, we saw a smoke-blackened cloud on port. Once again we began the hunt, keeping contact with the steaming herd at a distance of ten miles. When Wiesner relieved me on the bridge, I lowered myself into the tower, then dropped into the hull. Here, in humidity of 100%, with the waves showering salt water through the hatch onto the metal deck, I went to work feverishly at the chart table, plotting course. Condensing moisture dripped from overhead plates, pipes and ducts onto charts and paper. My parallel ruler did not slide nor my pencil write. Water sloshed around my feet to the rhythm of the boat's rocking. At 8pm, I again took my place in the starboard front nook of the bridge. The captain was at my back. Suddenly a searchlight, very faint, beamed into the dusk in the southwest. For seconds only, we chased after the clue. Forty minutes later, shadows loomed ahead, feeble, unreal. A quick correction, of course, and we surged forward on a parallel track with the convoy. Our powerful glasses revealed the classic picture of dim freighters wallowing in the blackness. We counted seventeen cargo ships, but there had to be more behind the rain squall. We detected an escort, port astern, and kept her under close surveillance. The captain held his boat at a constant distance while we established all target values for a midnight attack. We charged forward, spreading foam and spray, breathing air full of smoke and soot. The wind howled and the waves thundered above the clatter of our engines as we raced past the shadows and outmaneuvered two escorts with ease. The sea swallowed our small steel drum, only the tip of the bridge protruded. Now we stood in the horseshoe up to our necks in water, tied to the boat with wide steel belts. The phantoms rocked in several columns westward, their broad flanks exposed temptingly. Through the savage wind and throbbing engine noise, I heard shouted commands and bellowing reports from below. The executive clung to the TBT to hold himself erect while aiming through it at the numerous targets. The final moment had come for some of the giants, and for those who manned them, open fire. Screamed Paulson, the storm tearing his order from his mouth. Fire, 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 shouted the executive. Hard left rudder, steer 250, hollered the captain and slammed the cover of the voice tube shut. Long seconds ticked away. A blast, a fireball, then a loud detonation. A huge fountain rose over the dying vessel. A second bolt, a boom, a terrifying shriek, then a third explosion, a flaming jet. Large chunks of steel hurled into the illuminated clouds. The bare U of a 7,000-ton freighter broke off. The ship drifted, burning furiously amid the convoy, and was avoided only with difficulty by hard rudder manoeuvres of the vessels following. 
Erupting star shells and the roaring of heavy guns mingled with exploding cargoes and unfolding parachute flares to turn the night into a bright inferno. A destroyer, rushing north to the aid of the three victims, threatened to cross our track at close range. U-557 swerved, showing her tail, and was carried away in long lifts, lashed at by the waves. The unexpected interference caused us to lose sight of the two dying vessels, and we were unable to witness their demise. One hour of pursuit revealed no trace of a ship. It was as if the convoy had sprouted wings. We dived for a sound check, but adverse water conditions swallowed every sound. After surfacing again, Paulson followed a hunch and directed the boat into a southwesterly track. Dawn arrived, and with the new day came a stiff breeze. It chased the clouds low and pitched the spray high. Visibility changed rapidly from zero to three miles and back to zero again. We hunted all day without spotting a trace of a ship, but at dusk there was a sudden detonation in the port quarter ahead. A second one followed, typical torpedo hits. Another wolf had found the herd. Sweeping star shells showed us the way to the targets. One hour and sixteen miles later, we detected the first shadow. We followed the Phantom for twenty minutes, allowing the executive to obtain new target values. Suddenly heavy fog rolled in, and the target dissolved, just as suddenly a freighter appeared and bore down on us. Shadow bearing 240, cried someone. The ship's huge BAU moved toward us, so close that we could only shoot and run. The command came. Tube 5, fire and our boat turned to starboard just in time to avoid ramming the freighter. We waited 40 seconds, 60 seconds. The torpedo was amiss. Three vessels, spewing black clouds of soot, rose like mountains in front of our tubes. I could almost hear the throbbing of their piston engines. Paulson shouted over his shoulder, Executive, let them have what they deserve. Kern rapped out his orders in short spurts. Three torpedoes fanned out. Two explosions ripped the night. Then the pressure waves hit our faces. Two flashes blinded us for seconds. The scene was drenched in daylight as two cargo ships sent flames skyward. One ship turned wildly in a circle, her rudder jammed, both listed and sank within minutes, before their crews had time to lower the life rafts. A flash came from one of the shadowy cargo ships. We had sailed too close to her in our excitement, and a few ant-like figures on the aft deck had manned a cannon and were shooting at us. Two, three, four tall fountains rose around our boat. Several shells screamed over our heads. Speeding away from the spitting freighter, we hid behind a curtain of smoke and dropped to the end of the wounded herd. One hour later, torpedoes were hoisted into the tubes. U-557 reduced the distance to the convoy, then raced into it again, splitting it open from astern. Two merchantmen, still unaware of our presence, continued on their rigid course. Sink those monsters, executive, shouted Paulson. Two shots were fired in an instant. U-557 swung into a loop, quivered under the hard waves, then raced away. After two minutes, we realised that the torpedoes had missed. Paulson curbed his anger and steered his boat into a fresh assault. Destroyer, bearing 220, the high ship came charging out of nowhere, her bow rising knife-like in the blackness. Paulson bent over the hatch and hollered, Attention, chief, give us full power or an escort is going to bite off our stern. He squeezed his boat between two cargo ships, but the destroyer clung to our tail, a mere 200-odd metres astern. There was no chance to dive with safety. The captain made quick manoeuvres around a few bows and sterns, then a fast dash into the night through the furious seas. Death did not claim us. The good lord had put his thumb between the hunter and the hunted. After our escape, we returned to the attack, but found no trace of the convoy. Dawn came at 6.15am and we were alone in a water desert. The men, tired and disappointed, dozed or ate on battle stations. Food tasted awful. Bread had become mildewy, salami had turned green and slimy, and we washed down the battle sandwiches with a coffee that the Café Berge in Frankfurt could not have reproduced. Sweat, condensate and salt water had soaked our clothes, diluted the food and made everything clammy and sticky. We were drowsy from the boat's perpetual motion, weak in our knees, numb from cold, and almost deaf from the everlasting thunder of the diesel engines the wind and ocean. But the hunt went on, smoke clouds on port, the cry from the bridge excited the last man in the farthest compartment. 
Aching bodies rose and were instantly ready for action. As dusk closed in, we took on the convoy expecting nothing but success. It was the giddy sensation we always felt before an attack. Soon the misty, dirty night limited our vision, but we saw a ghostly escort moving across our wake at high speed. Then three, four cargo ships materialised on starboard, all in perfect position for our attack. A fast command, a hard rudder manoeuvre, then came Paulson's call. Shoot, Executive. I can't hold this course much longer. Kern swivelled the TBT, his aim hampered by the rampaging sea. Hell, get the eels out of the tubes. The captain slammed his order into Kern's face. The Executive, his hands clamped around the steel support of the TBT and his head pressed against the rubber cushion of the night binocular, swivelled again, focused, then screamed the orders that released two torpedoes. U-557 listed sharply as she described a short curve to port, an explosion a hit. One ship broke instantly behind the bridge, the second torpedo hit, the second victim listed to starboard, feverishly burning, her deck slipping closer to surface. The gale wind carried to us the stench of the explosions, the stink of burning cargo, the smoke of coal-fired boilers. The tubes now had to be recharged. U-557 dropped astern of the convoy, secured herself from a surprise attack, and wallowed incapacitated for an hour while our last torpedoes were hoisted into the tubes. Afterward, we resumed the chase. At dawn, the convoy was still far ahead. With the day came the rains. All morning and half of the afternoon, they whipped our faces and washed away the salt crusts. The convoy, meanwhile, had disappeared behind the low-hanging clouds. At 6.45pm, a destroyer floated into view. We kept her under careful surveillance and tenaciously followed her course. Two and a half hours after nightfall, we again sighted freighters, three shadows listing in the turbulent waters. U-557 closed the gap. A 7,000-ton vessel became Kern's target, and the torpedo hissed out of the tube. The ship nosed under instantly with a crashing boom, and as her stern reared up, we saw the propeller turning its last dying revolutions. Immediate counteraction, long-lasting flares hung in the dirty sky, their glare so brilliant that I could count the whiskers on the captain's face. And there, not far on port, the breaking ship shrieked in her last convulsive agony. Paulson manoeuvred through the columns cleverly and soon reached the dark section of the parade. The flares attracted an escort. She stopped near the sinking ship and began taking aboard survivors. She was an easy target, but an unwritten law prohibited attacks on ships engaged in rescue operations. And so Paulson broke into the herd again. He was in high spirits. This battle went his way. He dictated the terms. After 90 minutes of pursuit, runoff and re-entry, we managed to break into the centre of the remaining ships. A 10,000-ton monster was Paulson's target. We had but one precious torpedo left in the aft tube. U-557 slammed against the waves as she struggled into attack position. Somehow, the executive's order to fire was heard above the raging gust. The last torpedo streaked toward the Phantom, a quick getaway, a run into the wall of the night. But as hard as we listened and strained our eyes and hoped, there was no hit. The battle had come to an end. U-557 left the convoy the same hour. Our course set for the Bay of Biscay and port. Later, we dived to give the crew a well-deserved rest. Only a few hands stayed awake to keep the boat afloat. For hours, there was absolute peace. The only sounds heard aboard were the soft humming of the electric motors and the tiny thuds of the condensate drops hitting the deck plates. Our latest toll, harvested from a single convoy, was six ships sunk and two more possibly destroyed. These triumphs were matched and surpassed by several other U-boats, whose radio reports we picked up on our way back to Lorient. U-107, a somewhat larger boat, had cost enemy shipping over 100,000 tonnes on a single operation. All told, ships totalling more than 160,000 tonnes were destroyed in October, and 200,000 gross weight tonnes had been sent to the bottom in September. In London that fall of 1941, a record amount of tonnage had to be stricken from Lloyd's Register. It was a hard time for the maritime insurance business. On October 27th, U-557 sailed into Lorient Harbour. A gay crowd awaited us. This time, however, the girls from the establishments were not among the well-wishers, as we learned later, 
The naval complex had been fenced off against unauthorised personnel. But after our usual welcome home dinner and a thorough washing, a good portion of our men found their French girls holding open house in the downtown bordellos. Most of the men were not seen on the base before reveal the next morning. On the afternoon of November 3rd, the crew again assembled in the large square of the prefecture. Admiral Dönitz had come from his command post to greet us. Again he dispensed medals with a lavish hand. I watched proudly, unaware that these were my last minutes as a member of the crew of U-557. After the affair, Paulson broke the news that I was transferred to the first U-boat flotilla in Brest, the largest port on the coast of Brittany. It was a hard blow. Only reluctantly did I accept the order that separated me from my many friends and from the boat on which I had found my cause. The wonderful camaraderie that had united enlisted men and officers was suddenly, for me, a thing of the past I no longer belonged. As I said goodbye to captain and crew, I saw traces of moisture in several eyes. That day was the last time that I shook the hands of those men, those dear comrades who had escaped death with me so often. U-557 left Lorient on November 19th for the Mediterranean. She succeeded in breaking through the Strait of Gibraltar, where the British had set up a tight blockade and crowned her career with the sinking of the British cruiser Galatea near Alexandria. But U-557 met her fate on December 16th in the ironic form of an Italian destroyer, the Orione, a ship of a friendly nation which accidentally rammed her in the Sea of Crete. U-557 went to the bottom, carrying her whole crew down into eternal entombment. On November 5th, I was chauffeured by a Russian immigrant driver across the sun-drenched landscape of Brittany. As our Citroën chased down the highway, the needle of the speedometer often crept over the 120-kilometer mark. Speed and sun and the beautiful countryside soon changed my mood. It was exhilarating to come back from the inferno at sea and find myself flying across a foreign world full of marvels. Nonetheless, I was relieved to step out of the car when it careened to a stop at the gate of the first U-boat flotilla in Brest. Before me, overlooking the bay, lay a sprawling granite complex. Some of the buildings were not yet completed, the stately structures had been built to house the French Naval Academy, but our conquest of France had put a halt to the college programme. Instead of French enthusiasts, German U-boat aces had moved into the quarters. I reported briskly to the adjutant of the flotilla. He told me that I would soon have to attend U-boat school. The winter term was about to begin. This was disappointing news. However, I had no objection to a few days of idleness after six months of extraordinary activity. I established myself in a room with a breathtaking view of the harbour and Crozon Peninsula. Then I went out to explore the town. Brest, I had been warned, was a hotbed of espionage and sabotage. Occasionally, too, members of the French resistance abducted or murdered our men. But the city was busy and peaceful. Its cafes, bistros and shops were gay and thriving, and the presence of countless Germans in uniform offered added reassurance. It was a sunny November day. The scent of fall was in the air, and I resolved to enjoy myself to the fullest. After a delicious seafood dinner, I walked through the picturesque streets, stopped at this cafe or that, and browsed through every bookstore I passed. In one of these shops, I saw Yvonne, she worked there. Her blonde hair and blue eyes attracted me at once. I asked her for some books that she could not possibly have, and managed to engage her in a conversation that ended with a dinner date for the following evening. The next day, fearing that sudden transfer orders would spoil my plans, I left the base early and spent another pleasant afternoon wandering through Brest. Well before the time to meet Yvonne, I was waiting impatiently for her in a bistro across from the city hall. She was graceful, fragile and afraid. Her only contact with a German, she said, had been an occasional remark over the counter on the subject of books. But soon she found herself in an unpatriotic tete-a-tete with one of the intruders in the obscure light of an exclusive restaurant. Dinner was excellent desert was sweetened by her promise to see me again. The evening ended much too soon and, to my great disappointment, at the fence surrounding her house on the other side of town. I met Yvonne again the following evening, not during daylight, for she did not wish to be seen in public with me. At her gate after sunset, under the protection of the growing darkness, she was not so afraid any more. 
From then on, I was a regular guest at Yvonne's home. Whenever I went to her, I secured my gun at my belt, determined to meet Yvonne and not my executioner, a member of the Maquis, in a lonely alley of Brest. Whenever I slipped out of Yvonne's home, it was sunrise, never before, for I wanted a clear view of anyone who might be following me through the streets of Brest. I never asked Yvonne more than I needed to know. She said that she loved me, and that was all I wished to hear. In turn, I promised her everything for the love she so graciously spent on me. I enjoyed these days of sunshine and autumn flowers. But after two weeks came the task of telling Yvonne about my new command. We vowed to see each other again as soon as I would return. I hoped to be back in the spring, when the cherry blossoms would be in bloom. The last I saw of her was her bright scarf disappearing in the night as my train pulled out of the station.